At the very bottom of the periodic table, we find the actinide section. None of the 15 elements and 437 isotopes are stable with half-lives ranging from nanoseconds to billions of years. They sometimes have unusual mode of decay and others have interesting properties we've learned to take advantage of. Although they were all formed in the supernova, only four remain in the Earth's crust today and only two of them can be found in quantity large enough to be mined economically. All the others are generated by either radioactive decay, made in nuclear reactors and particle accelerated, or during a nuclear explosion. Only three have found marginal use in everyday items, like thorium and uh, gas mantle and welding rods, uranium and glassware and armor-piercing ammunition, and finally americium in smoke detectors. This video focuses on americium and its most common isotope, americium-241. Our story begins in 1869 with Dmitry Mendeleev, who proposed a way to classify all these 70 known elements in a way that would make sense to chemists. This arrangement forces Mendeleev to leave some spot for yet undiscovered element. Germanium, scandium, and technetium were some of his prediction, but if we look at this table from 1871, there is also a spot for an element beyond uranium. This remained a curiosity, generating little interest in the scientific community, and this spot will not be filled for several decades. Everything changed in 1933 after the discovery of artificial radioactivity in this famous experiment conducted by Mary Curie's daughter, Irene, and her husband, Frederick Joliot Curie. They used the alpha particle from a strong source of polonium to bombard aluminum foil and trigger a nuclear reaction, effectively changing an element into another, and have recreated this experiment in another video, link in the description. With the neutron discovery a year prior, an Italian scientist named Enrico Fermi took notice and started conducting similar experiments using neutron as projectile instead of alpha particles. When him and his team got to uranium, the results were inconclusive enough to throw serious doubt on the possible existence of higher mass element. In retrospect, Fermi was using fast neutron and had likely made the first fission, but nobody at the time considered this to be a likely explanation. Now, in the early 30s, the periodic table looked different than the one we are familiar with today. According to this, the new element uh, would have chemical properties similar to rhenium, and this pushed many chemists in the wrong direction when trying to isolate the new element candidate. Neptunium is actually closer to Promethium, and this problem was uh, rectified in 1944 by Glenn Seaborg. With the discovery of nuclear fission on the eve of World War II, the scientific attention was focused on fission. This unhealthy combination of the discovery and the war effort concerned the scientific community enough for Einstein to warn President Roosevelt in this famous letter dated August 2nd, 1939. In the course of the last four months, it has been made probable through the work of Joliot in France as well as Fermi and Zillard in America, that it may be possible to set up a nuclear chain reaction in the large mass of uranium, by which vast amount of power and large quantity of new radium-like element would be generated. Now it appears almost certain that this could be achieved in the immediate future. In November 1939, the Advisory Committee on Uranium agreed with Einstein that the Manhattan Project was getting traction and finances. Using the 60-inch cyclotron in Berkeley, California, Philip Abelson and Edwin McMillan found some previously unknown half-lives in the uranium oxide target prepared for slow neutron irradiation. The expected uranium-239 was decaying as the new element was being produced. They could have discovered plutonium as well, but their focus was on better decay and short half-lives. Late May 1940, the discovery of element 93 was announced, and since uranium was named in 1791 after the recent discovery of the planet Uranus, naturally, the new element beyond uranium shall be called Neptunium. Shortly after the announcement of the discovery of Neptunium, security would be reinforced around all things nuclear and every related publication would be delayed. Between 1940 and 1944, the very same cyclotron was used to discover plutonium, americium, and curium by a team of scientists led by Glenn Seaborg. The discovery of plutonium was not made public until the end of 1945 for obvious reason. And because the existence of americium and curium is tied to the neutron cross-section of plutonium, their discovery was also kept secret until after the war. 
But in November 1945, Glenn Seaborg was part of a radio show for kids when this happened. And now I have the honor to introduce Dr. Glenn T. Seaborg. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. When I was invited to take part in your Armistice Day program, I said I would on one condition, that I was not in competition with the quiz kids. Have there been any other new elements discovered, like plutonium and neptunium? Uh, oh, yes, Dick. Uh, recently, there have been two new elements discovered, elements with atomic number 95 and 96, out at the Metallurgical Laboratory here in Chicago. So now you'll have to tell your teachers that uh, to change the 92 elements in your school books to 96 elements. And just like that, the world learned about the Miracium and Curium. Now that the cat is out of the bag, let's take a look at it. Element 95 was made from double neutron capture on plutonium-239. And much like europium, a Miracium prefers the plus-3 oxidation state. So to separate it from plutonium, the uh, target is dissolved in hydrochloric acid to yield the plus-3 state for both metals. The separation can be done on ion exchange column like Seaborg did, using a luent like EDTA. The potential higher oxidation state of plutonium in solution can be reduced from plus 4 to plus 3 using hydroxylamine hydrochloride before oxalic acid precipitation, filtration, drying, and reused in the cyclotron. The americium is directly precipitated with oxalic acid and the americium oxalate is then heated to 470 degrees Celsius to form the black americium dioxide, ready for use. Americium has 33 known isotopes with a half-life ranging from nanoseconds to over 7,000 years, but the most common isotopes are americium-241, 243, and 242. As a general rule, actinides with odd numbers of protons and neutrons can fission, so americium can be burned in fast breeder reactor. It is said to be fissionable. Today, americium-241 is generated in nuclear reactor at a rate of 300-ish gram per ton of fuel per year. It can also be found in the fallout of nuclear detonations. I was able to detect both americium-241 and 243 in trinitite using X-ray spectroscopy and quantifying it with a mass spectrometer in these two videos here, link in the description. Americium-241 can conveniently be milked out of plutonium-241 that continuously generates it and can be separated chemically. The americium in ionization smoke detector is prepared that way. Americium-242 has a short half-life, so the 243 isotope is usually formed, and since the 242 isomer has a large neutron cross-section for fission, it is not common in nuclear waste. Americium-243 is the longest-lived isotope with a half-life of 7,350 years, but because it decays into the short-lived neptunium-239, its activity increased over time. Now, I can't do a video about uh, americium without messing with the source from a smoke detector. In the US, and since 2017, americium is produced at the PF4 plutonium processing plant in Los Alamos, New Mexico. The oxide from earlier is incorporated with gold and palladium on the silver support and pressed into sheets about 3 micron thick. The source is then punctured out and seated on the stainless steel or aluminum support. The amount of americium in each button does not exceed a fraction of a microgram for an activity in the low microcurie. In this context, americium-241 is used for its main alpha emission. Because of the layer of gold, the alpha particles escape with a broader energy spectrum. Some came right through, seen here, at max energy, and others bounce around and come out weaker here. This is a liquid sunlation capture of the alpha emission from americium-241. There is also quite a few gamma energy line, but uh, the one everyone is familiar with is this one at 5954 kilo electrovolt or so. Using my 3 inch sodium iodide scintillation crystal, the peak is immediately recognizable. The detector also reveals a smaller peak about 30 keV, weaker than the main one. This could be the 2% emission rate of americium 241 at 26.34 keV, but it could also be the 28 keV from iodide fluorescence in the crystal. To determine which one it is, I've looked at the X-ray spectrum which has better resolution at lower energy and no iodine. So the secondary emission of americium 241 is here, and my detectors show about 26.41. 0 0.07 keV is close enough. But that's not even the biggest peak. This one at 17.7 
is uh, actually from the air shell of Neptunium-237. Neptunium started to build up in the source, and this one at about 13 keV is also a Neptunium contribution. Gold from the support can be found glowing in X-ray at 9.77 and 11.44 keV. Gamma photon carry enough energy to free an inner shell electron, which produce an X-ray when a higher electron falls in closer to the nucleus to replace it. When this happens near the surface of the detector, the released X-ray can escape and only a partial energy is deposited. If this happens often enough, we see an escape peak a few kV below the main photo peak, and we can see it right here. Americium-241 can also spontaneously fission with an event every second per gram. So a source like this would see a fission event once a month or so. To be able to see any fission product, one would have to wait 83 million years to barely detect anything. With a half-life of 432 years, this source will accumulate a few percent of Neptunium every decade. Neptunium-237 has a half-life of 2 million years which makes it harmless in the environment. This is why americium 241 is a good candidate for smoke detectors. Its half-life is long enough to be useful, unlike polonium-210, and unlike americium 243 its decay product is less radioactive, so the activity remains constant on a human time scale. And it does not generate fissile isotope over time. Its gamma emission is also weak enough did not pose a threat if one decides to accumulate large amount of smoke detectors, so a pretty safe choice. Nevertheless, smoke detectors should be returned for proper disposal. Now this is the part where I'm supposed to tell you to not try this at home and all the usual corporate crap. If you made it this far in the video, you already know what you're doing, and if not, you probably don't have any of the equipment I'm using here. This is the residual gas analyzer I used in several previous video. It's attached to an ultra high vacuum chamber I can pump down below 10 minus 7 tor using this turbo molecular pump. I made a small support from a stainless steel wire and placed the source on it. I can then heat it to roughly 1000 degrees Celsius to try to evaporate some of the source material in the vacuum and maybe pick up some of its constituents. Interestingly, the RGA is sensitive enough to show a constant flow of helium from the alpha decay, generating a pressure below 6.10 minus 9 torr. After several minutes of heating, I looked at mass 241 and 237 but could not resolve anything above the noise. I tried different resolution and because the mass of americium dioxide, I looked at mass 273 as well but nothing showed up. Between mass 220 and 300, I accumulated the peak heights for many passes trying to see anything that would rise above the noise but failed again. I also tried sputtering and high voltage. Past 10,000 volt, my computers usually gets pretty useless. But again, nothing. This would have been a nice addition to finalize this analysis, but uh, what could we really gain from the mass spectrum? We have already identified the main isotope, its decay daughter, the source support material, and even some of the detector internals. The only potential trace isotope that may be present we haven't detected yet is plutonium-241, although unlikely. I don't know how old this source is, but the 14 year half-life of plutonium-241 can make detection difficult after a while. Finally, plutonium-241 and americium-241 are isobaric, meaning their exact masses are too close for the mass spectrometer to resolve. So we get a peak, but uh, cannot tell which isotopes we are looking at anyway. To determine if plutonium-241 is even present, a chemical separation would be needed before attempting a better spectroscopy. But this is probably a wide goose chase. Yes, early in 1940, Dr. McMillan and P.H. Abelson uh, first identified the element Neptunium. Before I let you go, let me recommend the uh, Studio 326 channel, where you can find interesting reviews on a wide variety of gag counters and a range of similar topics. The man obviously does his research and presents a fair, comprehensive, and funny look at radio protection equipment. I especially enjoy his views on the Gamma Scout and the YouTube algorithm. So, this is probably not your first YouTube video and you know what to do. Thumbs up if you like it, subscribe if you want, Patreon, bell, share. I hope to see you again on the next one and thank you for watching. Damn it!